change slide. Hello everybody, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for taking time out of this amazing event to come and listen to my talk, which I've called Empowering the Family, because it's not easy bringing up a child on your own, is it? In fact, it's not easy bringing up a child at all. It's not easy bringing up a child who threatens you with baseball bats, with cricket bats, with chairs. It's not easy bringing up a child who has four or five or six meltdowns every day and who wakes up in the middle of the night to have more meltdowns. It's not easy bringing up a child who tries to push you in front of traffic when you're walking along to the shop. It's not easy bringing up a child who has meltdowns in the supermarket and you literally have to drag him across the floor, have to pin him down and lie on top of him to stop him from hurting himself or causing damage or hurting other people. It's not easy bringing up a child who is excluded from not one, but three infant schools. Three infant schools, my youngest son, could cope with a term just about and a few days in after the holiday he'd have a meltdown so bad that I'd go and fetch him and I'd say don't bring him back. We don't want him here, he's a danger to the other children. I was in despair. I didn't know what to do with him, I didn't know what was wrong with him and I went to different experts and different professionals for years. And they all said the same thing. It's not easy bringing up a child on your own, is it? Which is why I've subtitled my talk. What have I done to deserve a child like this? Why was it my fault that this was happening to my son? He was so similar to his older half-brother who hadn't been in a single parent family at that age, yet he displayed similar, less severe behaviour, but nevertheless similar behaviour. So why was it me? Why was it me as a single parent that was failing my son so much I didn't believe that? I even tried to give him away. His behaviour was so extreme and so bad I didn't know how to cope with it. So on the way back from the shop one time, I took him into the social services office and said, take him away. I can't cope with this. And a social worker brought a form out and she said, here, sign this. But he won't go to a family. He'll have to go into a children's home. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't give up on my son. I had to go back and find out more. I couldn't, I couldn't bear the thought that he was going to have bath time without me. Bath time without the cuddle and the story and the tickle on his tummy and the raspberry on his tummy. I couldn't bear that thought. I had to learn how to be a super parent, how to deal with this. And I had to learn strategies that worked for both of us. Now I've moved away from my usual format and I've created what I've called fridge magnets. Anybody who's seen me speak before, has anybody been to one of my workshops before, will know that I'm really image heavy. I have very, very few words on the screen. Most of what you see is like you would see on this slide at the, at the beginning, at the end of my talk. But I've made these fridge magnets with a pretty picture and a snappy little quote. So if you want to get your, your phone out and take pictures of it, then by all means do so. Please do. I'd be happy for that to happen. Let's move on. This is what happened when I got my diagnosis 11 years ago. I felt justified and I felt vindicated. I'd been brought up in an environment where I was not okay. Not only was I not okay, I was bullied mercilessly. I was treated inconsistently. My parents thought I was brilliant. I was so bright, I was so intelligent. 
Yeah, because I was a poor at maths. I get numbers muddled up. It's a diagnosable condition now. It's similar to dyslexia, only with numbers. It's called dyscalculia. I was stupid. I came top in my mocks. They were O-levels back then. I came top in English. I came top in English language and top in English literature. I was so pleased with that. I was so excited about that. I went home and said, look, I came top in English language and I came top in English literature. And the response was, I'll think you're intelligent when you can do mathematics. What kind of way to bring up a child is that? I wanted to turn my pain into purpose. Autism changed my life. The diagnosis changed my life. I knew there was nothing wrong with me. It was okay to be different. I was fine with that. And I wanted to take my pain as a child growing up into an adult and as a parent with a child who was displaying the behaviour that my son did and I wanted to turn that into something purposeful. I wanted to turn that into something that would mean something to other people so that they didn't have to go through the kind of things that I went through. So that they never treated their child the way that I was treated. So that they could bring their child up with a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more understanding than I had. And I wanted to turn the whole trauma into something triumphant. Something that would change just one person's life. That would change just one person's way of thinking. And I wanted to take my heartbreak and make it into something hopeful. Something that people could look at and think, she got through it, I can get through it. They did it, I can do it too. Her son's done this, my son can do it. There is hope for my son, there is hope for my family. And I'm going to move on. What I was learning was that there was a new kind of normal. I'd started working with researchers a few months after my diagnosis. And I've worked with researchers all over the country doing a variety of autism tests, helping postgraduate students to get their doctorates. And I'm still in touch with many of them today. They've gone on, they've, they, they've graduated, they're doing research, they're doing fantastic things, they're developing a world of understanding and acceptance for the autistic community. It is a new kind of normal. You don't think the way that other people think. You don't approach life and you don't approach problems the way other people approach problems. A psychiatrist told me that when I was 30, way before I had my, my Asperger diagnosis. But he was describing Asperger syndrome. And he started me on a journey of discovery and heartbreak and trauma. And it brought me into a new world and a new kind of normal. And that normal is fine. You learn with your child. You get the baby in your arms. They don't come with an instruction book. You get the baby in the arms. You don't expect a child to have disabilities. So all the parenting books you read do not prepare you for a child with any kind of disability at all. So when problems occur, how are we prepared for it? Just as ordinary parents. We might be teachers or work in the medical profession. We might have a little prior knowledge, but let's face it, most of us don't. We have to learn, we have to grow. These are my children. Both of my sons have a, a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, just the way I do. I was diagnosed before my children and I recognised that I had Asperger's syndrome by doing research on behalf of my youngest son. And I thought, this is me. This is me all over. If this is me and I have Asperger's syndrome, then the rest of the family will come down. And they have. Both of my sons and Denise. And my niece is my sister's daughter. 
And I'm telling you now, she's far more like me than she's like her mum. It's uncanny. But the similarities between us are there and they're real. When my eldest son was very small, I let him choose his own library books. I didn't try to direct his interests. I let him go and choose and he'd toddle around, picking up books. And he'd go through areas of specific special interest and we learned together. We learned all about spiders and snakes. We learned all about crocodiles and alligators. We learned all about farming machinery. We learned all about JCBs and everything that he went through. And he went through each special interest in turn. And when he'd finished it, he closed the book on it and walked away and moved on to something else. He's 34 now and he's still pretty much the same. He's married has a lovely wife. He graduated from university with a first and a prize and he also has Asperger's syndrome. He's a financial analyst for quite a big company in the UK. He's doing really well. But I didn't want him to grow up the way that I'd grown.